astray I empathize with your cross wires I may even share your twisted desires But never go out of my way To see me fall Oh, do you remember when you came to me On the outside looking in You pitched your tent Stole my shit and hit, hit the road again Never did nothing without an angle down below Like everyone else, only so much more so Never go out of my way to see you fall You can trash my songs, forget my lines Drink of my women, steal my wine You can claw your way to the bloody top But never go out of my way I'd never go out of my way to see Never go out of my way to see you fall. I guess it's just a matter of a couple of degrees between standing on your belly and crawling on your knees. Remember you and your demons showing up at the door. A bottle of Herodura at a quarter to four. I cared for you when you didn't even know yourself. Man, I helped you become somebody else. Still, I'd never go out of my way to see you fall. You can trash my songs, forget my lines. Drink of my women, or steal my wine. You can claw your way to the bloody top, but I'd never go out of my way. I never go out of my way. I never go out of my way to see you fall. Hey, why don't we have some guitar? Everybody, what's going on? What's hot? What's hip? What's happening? What's shaking? Cats and kittens. We've got a great show planned for you today. Welcome to our bonus content exclusive YouTube pre show network programming. We'll begin in one hour and seven minutes. Till then, it's just us kids. And if you've got a hashtag you'd like in our tweet today, please get that baby prepared because I'm. I've got an itchy tweet finger today. I'm itching to tweet, man. I'm itching to tweet. Don't you double dog dare me. Dolores Colbert, first one in the room today. She says, hey, hey, Tom. Hey, hey, Dolores. Thomas Hamilton from Glasgow, Scotland is here with us. He's a great lad. He's one of our mates. Uh, let's see here. Dolores Colbert says, guitar. Yeah, we like the guitar part. Marty Vickers says, drink up my women, steal my wine. Oh, yes. The incredible lyrics of Mr. Tim Brickley, along with the Bleeding Hearts. Uh, Dolores Colbert saying, hi to folks. Morty's still here. Still more lies. Dolores wants still more lies. I don't know what that means, but I'll put it in my, my tweet. Uh... Because I can. There we go. Still more lies. Anybody else? Better make it quick. Better make it quick. 
Great stories for you today. Uh, hasn't been a woman executed in a long time, and apparently they're going to execute one. And some of you may say, well, that's kind of cruel. Why would you execute a woman? Well, this particular woman killed another woman that was pregnant and cut the baby out of her and then tried to pass the kid off as her own, apparently forgetting that she was never showing signs of being nine months pregnant. And so therefore, <clears throat> yeah. We're also going to tell you how a milk price check resulted in a stabbing at Walmart. Where else could it have uh, happened but Walmart, right? Uh, I need a price check on three. Stab, stab for milk. Uh, Morty Vicker has a hashtag for me. Tough actin tenactin. <laughs> trigger figure. Okay. You got it. Act. Tin, tin, actin. Tough actin, tin, actin. Oh, uh, <laughs> that's all I got room for. <laughs> oh, Morty, you slay me, man. And now here's the person that these people, they just, they just, it's like, hey, I, I, there's a lot of people, those of you who've been in the workforce, who will send out emails at the very end of their work day just so everybody knows they're working. Can you dig it? Thomas Hamilton says, just watch the Celtic game. Well, let's just see what the final. Midnight Shepherds here says, how goes it, Tom? I am I'm better than a, slicker than a 10-penny whistle. Uh, let me see here. Let's see here. Oh, it's 1-1 uh, draw versus Hibernian. Arsenal are off to the fourth round of the FA Cup, having beaten Newcastle 2-0 in extra time. Thanks in large parts to the heroics of goalkeeper Bernd Leno. Anyway, we got a good story. We got a good show for you. We got good things planned for you. We had a wonderful little uh, uh, UK lockdown special on Saturday. And had some fine people from the UK in on that. That was great. Enjoyed it. We'll do it again this week. We'll do it till you guys aren't on lockdown anymore. Uh, Midnight Shepherd says he's beat. Busting me hump all day. Well, I am sorry to hear that. I have a philosophy. It's really more than a philosophy, I think, at this point. It's kind of a truism that I'm pawning off as a philosophy. And that is when you work for an employer, there's some days that you go in and you get a fair day's wage and your employer gets a fair day's work. And there are some days where the employer gets the better end of the bargain because you're just doing so much work. And then there's other days when, when you get the better end of the bargain. And not that you want to cheat anyone, but, but we'd all like to have a lot more of those days where we get the better end of the bargain. But it seems like sometimes you go through a spell where you're like, man, somebody's making out on this deal and it's not me. But then it's kind of rewarding, you know, when you have like a week or a two-week period where you do just like this Herculean amount of work, and uh, which is normally followed by a good amount of uh, gold bricking, you know, uh, hopefully. And uh, my days generally are... A tie is all I can hope for. Every now and then, but not very often. And usually it's it's the other way around. Dolores says, Saturday, the UK kids still had me in house party from Friday night through Saturday during your showtime. Crazy kids. That's okay. Every now and then you got to street it up a little bit for the kids. That's the way the kids like it. One hour till network programming. The kids like it that way. A lot of NFL football on this weekend. Six whole games. 
And the great news is next week we get four games. We had three games on Saturday, three games on Sunday. This next week we get two games on Saturday, two games on Sunday. That's going to be awesome. I'm not even that crazy about football. But it's nice. It's nice because we're coming down to the end of the NFL season. We're getting down to the final, you know. And then at, right after the NFL season is a season that I call a rest season because everything's over with. The players have way too much money, no impulse control, and nobody's ever said no to them. Midnight Shipper says at thirteen fifty an hour can't beat it. Well, it's okay. Just gotta hope for that overtime, boss. I'm hoping for that overtime. This, of course, is a very special episode of the Tom Gully Show After Dark. This technically is the bonus content exclusive YouTube pre-show to that. And we do enjoy you guys coming in for the pre-show where it's a freewheeling, rollicking, frolicking. Live on the rage of edge, laugh in the face of death. Unscripted format. Yes. 817-522-3948 if you'd like to call in and chew the fat. Dolores Colbert says, so ticked off at the Steelers, I can't even express. I don't know what was wrong with Big Ben yesterday. And I don't know what was wrong with his receivers either. I mean, I, there's a lot of blame to go around there. But when you get down 28 zip, and there's like six minutes left in the first quarter, y'all are in trouble. And I thought they were going to right the ship there for a while, but no. They were dropping passes. He was throwing inexplicable. Uh, Morty Vickers says, for some reason, I didn't get an alert for Saturday's show. Well, balderdash, I won't stand for this. I'm going to issue a sternly worded letter. No, I don't know. I don't know how that happened. I don't know how that would have happened, Morty. We, 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 of course, value you more than anything. But we did a little show on Saturday, and we talked about UK things and um, stuff. Just for those of you who weren't there, we talked about the fact, and this will, man, this will... I, I don't think... The majority of Americans are aware of this. Hey, Diana O'Brien's with us. Hello, Diana. Randy Ramos, the chef, is in the house. Thank you so much. Um, I got to tell you, most Americans don't know about this. And when they find out, they can't believe it. Okay. But over in the United Kingdom, they have to pay the equivalent of 212 American dollars just for free television. What we would get for free here over the antenna or free cable or whatever it is, they have to pay for a license to get broadcasting, and all that money goes to the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, and that's what they use to fund the news and all their television shows and things like that. So they actually, you can actually get fined money for not having a license and listening and watching to television over there. And most Americans that I know go, oh my God, are you kidding me? They don't just get it free over the noob. They get radio for free. They didn't used to. Sometime, I believe, in the 70s, they just went full-on licensing for TV. You can listen to the radio for free now, but you didn't used to be able to. Uh, Morty Vickers says, after going 11-0, the Steelers went 1-5. Something has been going on for weeks now. They took last week off against the Browns, too. Uh, Dolores says, right, Morty. Thomas Hamilton says, Arsenal versus Crystal Palace. 8 o'clock in Scotland. On Thursday. Diana Bryan says, Blessings, Tom. 
Well, yeah, Arsenal is uh, the holders of the FA Cup, and they um, have won it more than anyone else. And uh, But the match against Crystal Palace upcoming is just a regular league match. And then they got to play Newcastle again uh, the following Monday, who they just beat in the FA Cup. So when's our next... And we don't know yet who we're going to play. They haven't done the draw for the next round of the FA Cup, which will be a week from this Saturday, I think. Something like that. Something like that. Let me see here. Dolores Colbert says, So I assume commercial-free TV then over there. Uh, no. <laughs> there are actually commercials. Not nearly as many as we have. But it is not commercial-free. Thomas Hamilton says Celtic versus Livingston on Saturday at 3 o'clock. That's 7 a.m. Pacific. That's 10 a.m. Eastern time here in the United States. So, yeah, they have to pay for over-the-air television. And they pay $212 a year for that. It's not like five bucks. I mean, it's, it's, uh, uh, Diane O'Brien says you can pay monthly, though. You know, um, eight one seven five two two thirty nine forty eight. If you want to call in, yeah. When I first learned that, I was like, Are "You are kidding me!" Nope. Nope. Diane O'Brien says, uh, "I remember back in the day getting fined for no TV license." Ooh, Diana, that had to hurt. Yeah, they go around and check. You better have your TV license. Or you're going to get fined. It's theft. They don't like it. There's videos on YouTube of the police coming up. And, man, people just get so mad at the police for coming and nailing them for no license. Um, it's It's not good. It's not good. People from time to time here in the States will steal cable, especially if you live in like an apartment complex. Oh, yeah. I, I've probably had two or three apartments that I moved into, and they had forgotten to turn the cable off. So I just plugged in and had free cable and had it for a long time, one place. I mean, I had it for three or four years. I, I had it so long, I forgot that I was just plugged into it and it went out one time and I was actually on the phone calling up the the cable company to complain that the cable was out when I suddenly realized, oh, wait a minute, I'm not, I'm not paying for this. Because all the cables are in a big junction box and those guys come in and hook one up and they just, you know, they don't, they don't get anything from the apartment complex or anybody else. Um, they just close somebody's account and it, the service guys are so busy they don't they don't come back and unhook the cable they probably have a way to do it remotely now or something but um but some people actually proactively steal cable uh <laughs> midnight shepherd says if it wasn't for stealing cable i could watch the tom gully show well you know Let's, uh... Terry Lawler, the King of Ireland, has joined us. But can you believe that? I just we we've taken it so for granted here in the United States. Naturally, we pay for cable or satellite or Netflix or whatever. But we our regular broadcast channels, of which when I was in Dallas, I think I got sixty four over the air channels. Um, now I'm out here and I think I have like 34, 36, um, but nope, don't have to pay a penny. Just get yourself a TV and an antennae and you got digital broadcast coming over. Lustrous high definition digital broadcasting. 
Um, I remember, I think it was in 2008, when the United States switched from analog to digital over the air. I wasn't happy about it. I was real mad. And then it, and then it came over. I got, you know, I got my little converter box because I wasn't going to get a smart TV that had the right kind of tuner and all that. But they, they, they sent you a check for forty-five dollars so that you could reconnecting after one second reconnection success. Apparently, our local, while we're on the subject, uh, my internet service provider, I, I, I haven't noticed any problems. Well, I kind of have, but uh, other people have um, other people like online. I've seen people complaining that there's problems with it. We can't be having that. Uh, Morty Vicker says, my uncle used to work as a side job going from bar to bar, checking if they were showing PPV fights, pay-per-view fights, had a list of establishments that paid to show it. Everyone he caught illegal, got illegally showing it, got him $200. Uh, yeah, I'm aware of that. I'm also aware of, People getting caught, and they would say, "Look, you can either sign up for three years of this service, or <laughs> or you pay two hundred bucks." Um, Diana Bryan says, "It's a wonder they don't charge us for fresh air. Boy, they'll find a way someday." Uh, Morty Vicker says, "I guess it costs thousands to order it for a bar to show it. That's why there's usually a door or cover charge." Exactly. Um, Terry Lawler asks, how is everyone tonight? Um, Midnight Shepherd says, the government tried checking if my inter internet was legit or not. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. Um, but uh, I had cable for years and years and years and years and years and years. And I can't remember when I got rid of it or just decided not to sign up for it. Because I said to myself... This cable is getting so expensive, I could just buy the movies I want. And if there's a match that I desperately need to see, I'll just go to Sports Bar and watch it. Uh, and then I started getting, that's when I started getting over the air television all the time and went, man, there's so much on here. Um, especially when they started, you know, it used to be when analog was around, you just had one channel, Channel 4. Well, then digital came and they were, able to squeeze so much more bandwidth digitally in there. So there's now there's channel 4.1, 4.2, 4.3, 4.4. And that's when they started re-showing all the old Westerns and crime dramas and, and all the old good stuff. Um, Thomas Hamilton says, I'm with Now TV. I think I've seen some YouTube videos that have the Now logo on them that people have uploaded. Mm. So, uh, but yeah, I do, I do remember when I moved to St. Louis, I was going to call the cable company and I went over to where the, the jack was in the wall and I went, why don't I just give this a try? Boom, free cable. Um. And then one of my apartments in Dallas, I had it seriously for like four years. And then one day I came home and turned it on and got pure snow. And I think that's when I went, I'm not even having this turned back on. Um, Dolores Colbert says, love that tune, Caledonia, what makes your big head so hard? Um... Yeah, maybe that's when I said I just don't need it, really. I can't remember. I just can't remember anymore. But it was it had gotten to the point where my cable was so expensive. Now, they added tons of channels, but I'm like, I only watch like maybe seven of these channels ever, and I have 300 channels. This is stupid. Um, Doris says, Swinging Blues Tune. Oh, I'm familiar with the tune. Diana Ryan says, So much choice now. It, yeah, it's just like it, oh, they, oh, it overwhelms you with things to watch. You're just, what, what should I? Ah. 
You know, I even now with my 34 channels, I have to go down my, and I do love the, um, what's the, what is going on here? I hate, let's see, I just, uh, let me see here. Um, <laughs> I um, I still to this day, um, Doris says repeat channels. Yeah, there's a little of that going on, and there's a little bit of it here. But not that much. It, it 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 doesn't bother me because the same company will own three or four stations, so they'll have the same stuff on. It's just they're far enough away that they cover anyway. Um, so I have the um, TV Guide app, which is great, uh, especially it'll give you broadcast or it'll give you um, antenna you know, a broadcaster antenna or, or it'll give you cable or satellite, whatever, uh, and all the providers. So you select which one you want. And mine, of course, is antenna broadcast. So I'm going down the list here. I'm looking at Adam 12 is on uh, 4.2. So that's in first place right now. I'm going down. Okay, the movie The Birdcage, which is good, but I've seen it. Uh, so Adam 12 is still in first place. This is how I do it. I put somebody in first place, and then I keep going down the thing. Uh, Growing Pains is on. No, Adam 12, still still in first. Knight Rider. Ooh, I'd have to think about that, but I like Adam 12 better. Um, NCIS Los Angeles. Uh, no, I'm not watching that. I, I get kind of burned out on that after a while. Um, and then we've got... Ooh! The Time Machine with Rod Taylor is on. Ooh, boy. You know what I would probably choose to do is I'd probably watch Adam 12 until it's over and then watch The Time Machine. So I, I kind of rank them and then pick what I want. But you still got a lot to go through. Uh, Terry Lawler says, I know Thomas mate Caledonia is the Roman name for Scotland. Diana Bryan says, we have Sky. Oh, I love Sky Sports. Love Sky Sports. Uh, Dolores Colbert says, oh, Cox Cable in her area. <laughs> Terry Lawler says, I have Sky. I call them every year to renew my contract, but I won't renew unless they give me something for free. And that's smart because I had uh, Time Warder Cable, which they changed the name to Spectrum. And I'm watching it, and I'm like, hey, man, why does a new sign-up pay like half of what I'm paying? I'm a good customer. I've been with them forever. So I called them up, and they knocked like 20 bucks off my bill. Uh, and I, I did that frequently. I'm like, you're making the new people pay $29.99. I'm paying almost 70 That doesn't seem fair to me. I'm a good customer. These new people, who knows what they are? Uh, Diana Bryan says, yes, best to barter with them, Lee, has to be done. You do. You do have to. And by the way, they will, after three or four months, start trying to creep it back up again. And that's when you call up and go, did, did we not have the talk? Did we not have the talk? I just got all blurry. There, I cleared up again. I was feeling blurry for a second. We've got just about 41 minutes until network programming, 817-522-3948. You know you want to call. You know you do. Maybe you're just waiting for network. Maybe the pre-show isn't good enough for you. Uh, Terry Lawler says, Two years ago I got a 50-inch all-spec TV they want me to pay their prices, then they must entice me. <laughs> That's right. That is right. But England had like cable and closed circuit more widespread than we did here. There, there were places where it was very developed here, but overall, I remember when we first got cable, and you don't see this much anymore, but we got like 
individual TV stations from different towns, like from Dayton, Ohio, or from uh, Cincinnati, or whatever, uh, in addition to Chicago and Atlanta, the two biggies. Um, got some different stuff. Um, Dolores Colbert says, These cable companies stop broadcasting your local stations, which includes the local news. Grr. Well, that's, that's because... Um, the local stations, just like the cable, charge them for the ability to show the local programming. Uh, now, that's not always true because the local cable franchise has to be awarded by the local municipality. So sometimes the local municipality says, look, you're going to show all the local TV on cable. Or we're not giving you the contract. That doesn't happen very often. And the, the local stations, you know, they they want to get paid for providing the content. So um, Dolores Colbert says, another reason I have over-the-air TV. Well, it's just smart to have, you know, sort of a rabbit ear antenna. Even if you have cable, in case the cable goes out during a hurricane, tornado, whatever, flood, then you've got the local TV. Randy Ramos says, does anyone have a fire stick? I don't have one, but I was dating a girl in Dallas that had me set hers up for her. She'd had it for like a year. It was a Christmas gift. I'm like, hey, you might want to set that up. Uh, Terry Lawler says, uh, do you pay a TV license to the government, Tom? It's compulsory here. It's supposed to go... To TV programming, but always ends up paying broadcasters exorbitant wages. Um, Terry, we were just talking about that a little earlier. Most Americans, A, do not know that you guys have to do that, and B, when they find out, it blows their mind. It still kind of blows my mind, and I've known about it forever, uh, that you guys have to pay a television license fee, which is about 212 American dollars. I think it's 157 pounds sterling um but we would there would be riots in the streets if they told us we had to pay and i also told them terry that that you actually had to pay a radio fee as well up until the 70s so uh yeah that that is just it's absolutely science fiction to people from the united states it's what 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 you're kidding, man. You're kidding. We talked about it on the UK special this weekend, the lockdown special. And it's also why British TV series are not on the same sort of... Some of them are, but, but sometimes a series will be real popular. It'll run to the end of that particular series. And... Uh, it won't come back for two or three years because they have to get funding and the actors might have gone on to something else and, you know, whatever. Um, Terry Lawler says, I have a fire stick. I get great American TV on it. My favorite channels being outdoor TV. A lot of people like the outdoor TV. It's very popular. It's very popular. Trust me. There was a period of time when I had cable where we got Sky Sports. So we got all, I mean, I got all the soccer and stuff. And then they started licensing it by country and ESPN started buying it. And, uh, Diane O'Brien says, fire sticks can sometimes muck up, which can be a pain in the, yeah, keep sorting out. It is if you hunt, Tom. Well, it's just a lot of people like the outdoor TV. Many people enjoy the outdoor TV. I used to like to watch Premier League. Uh, maybe they still have it on Sky Sports. I, won't, I wouldn't know. I haven't seen it in a long time. It was called Premier League Roundup. And it was like at 6 o'clock on Sunday night or something. And it just every game, all the highlights. It was fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. It was fabulous. Now you got to get uh, 
NBC Sports package. To see, they've got the EPL stuff now. So you got to get that to see it. They get a little on at halftime. They they show one game on regular NBC usually every weekend. Um, but unless it's my team, I don't watch it. <laughs> unless there's nothing else on, I'll I'll just glance at it once in a while, check the score. But I have a T-shirt somewhere that that just it says, "I despise the team you support." And then it just says Arsenal. It's just an Arsenal badge, which is kind of the truth. It's kind of the truth. I don't really care about any other team but my own. And I don't really care about any American sports teams. I just care about Arsenal. I, I, I kind of have a little dog in the fight for Major League Soccer. There's some teams I like, but if they lose, I don't know. It's not the end of the world. If Arsenal loses, it's just like, man... I'm just gutted all weekend. It's, it's awful. It's terrible. It's pathetic. The thing I hate is when the game is on Sunday. Uh, it's it's like if if the game's on Saturday and you lose, you've got the whole weekend to get over it. And if you win, you got the whole weekend to be, yeah, we won. If if it's on Sunday, you don't have enough time to get over it, and you don't get much time to celebrate it. Terry Lawler says, you must be gutted every weekend. So, Tom, well, first of all, Terry, we've won four games on the trot. But there was a period of time of about nine games there when I wasn't very happy. And you have to keep thinking back to the Invincibles, you know, 49 games without a loss in a row, and a whole Premier League season without losing a match. You think back to that, and you just go, man, that, and then you go, oh, wow, that was almost 20 years ago. Dino O'Brien says, I had a nanny nap today. Oh, my God, that's what this world's doing to me. I wish I could have a nap. I I got home and I was going to take a nap. And then I got an alert on my phone for a meeting that I'd completely forgotten about. And I called in a frantic freak-out mode. Are we still having that meeting? And Oh, no, 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 no. Because nobody had said anything about it all day. And uh, they went, oh, no, no, no. We're, we, that's been canceled. We're not having that. That's, you know, we just... I'm like, well, thanks a lot. I got the Zoom set up and everything else, and now I don't have any nap time. You ruined my nap. You screwed up my nap, man. That ain't fair. Ugh. Terry Lawler says, uh, no, no medals or championships for four in a row. Dude, we won the FA Cup. They don't hold it in the middle of the season. You know? We, we just won the last FA Cup. And we just beat Newcastle. We're on to the fourth round of this one. We've won it more times than anybody else. And we're the holders. I don't know what... I don't know what you want from me. Um, you know, Dolores Colbert says, I'm still stoked over last night's first quarter. Yeah, that just went. Who snaps the ball that far over the quarterback's head? How does that even happen? That that started out bad and got worse real fast. And then that second, that interception, and then the one through the receiver's hand, it was just... I don't know what was going wrong with Big Ben. And, and the receivers were just dropping stuff like crazy. And I hate Cleveland. I hate them. I'm not, I'm not a Baker Mayfield fan at all. Um, and, and one of the Steelers came out today and said, they're going to get smoked in the next round. I think he's probably right. That was in Pittsburgh, too. Ooh, man, that had to be rough. That had to be rough. 
I feel for you. Slop fest. I feel for you, Dolores. That's, that's, I feel for you. I do. There's another person I know that's a big Steelers fan that I don't feel for them. <laughs> I would rub it in if I could. But but you, I feel bad for. Terry Lowe says, isn't the FA Cup the lowest of the cups? Well, it's better than any of the ones they got in Ireland. I'm only pulling your chain, Tom. I don't even like soccer. You know, I'm either a hurling fan or a Gaelic football fan. I know, Terry. I know. You know. You just you it's the pain of being a fan. You live it up when you can and then there's long periods of time when you just don't. You just can't. And this is one of those periods of time. I remember the uh the big push to get Arsene Wenger out and uh boy what they wouldn't do for the top four finish now. <clears throat> Dolores uh, Colbert says, CBS News, be back. As Dolores knows, I used to work for CBS News. So, the Columbia Broadcasting System. I wish I could get a picture. They they aren't in the same studios. Oh, um, Morty Vickers just saw that Baker's wife gave a dude that is dying from cancer her box seats for last night's game. That's cool. That's cool. I worked at a little station in Anderson, Indiana. It was the second oldest station in Indiana. It was, it was called WHBU. And it's been bought now, and I don't know if it has the same call letters. And Anyway, it was in this old office building that looked like it was from a Phil Marlowe or Sam Spade, you know, the the signs on every door in this place were painted, you know, with a guy by hand, and um, you know, Johnson Insurance Company, you know, and ours had uh, the back door entrance into the studio. Um, it said uh, W A M. Said W H B U. Twelve forty A M. I think it was twelve forty. Pretty sure it was twelve forty. A CBS radio affiliate in these italic. It was so cool. So old school. Uh, let's see here. Let me find out about WHBUAM. It's 1240. I got it right. Person to person radio. Person to person radio. Uh, let's see. WHBU radio. It's, I guess it's on FM, FM too. Uh, it got it got bought up by a conglomerate. Um, full service oldies format. Well, we were news talk when I was there. Uh, longest running commercial radio station in Anderson. Second oldest radio station in Indiana. The oldest commercial station in Indiana. WHBU made its initial sign on in April of 1923. Its founder and original owner was the Anderson Broadcasting Corporation, and for much of its history, was located along with its rooftop transmitting tower in the Citizens Bank Building on Meridian Plaza in downtown Anderson. That's where, that's where I worked. Um, it was affiliated with CBS Radio Network until its sale in 1998. It was a standalone AM with full service, middle of the road format. Become and clustered and blah blah blah. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Reaching out, touching you was the jingle packages in the seventies. Um, let's see here. Hmm. Well, okay. Yes. Oh, Indiana Radio Archive article: Old Radio Tower Demolition with Photos. Oh boy, let me let me check that out. Uh, it was the last. It was a rooftop. They said tower. It was what we call an array. It was a bunch of cables that were in like a grid on top. 
Oh, no, I guess there was a tower on the rooftop as well. Um, so, you know. It was in this old building. It was very cool. It was very, very cool. Uh, Diane O'Brien says, To be fair, I used to love TV. Now we've got no choice but to watch continuously in lockdown. It's getting monotonous. I can imagine. I can imagine. I am a a sucker for old TV shows. I never get tired of watching them. Oh, you know what I watched this weekend? I watched the director's cut of Apocalypse Now. Yeah, it was good. It was good. I watched something else. Oh, I tell you what. Uh, about 25 minutes till network. I've I've got uh, 817-522-3948 if you want to call in. I think I can watch Walk Hard, the Dewey Cox story every single day and laugh every single time. That movie makes me laugh so hard. And I and I find new things to laugh at every time. This was a particularly bad case of someone being cut in half. I was unable to reattach the bottom half to the top half. Speak English, Doc. We're not scientists. <laughs> it's so funny. It is so funny. Oh. <laughs> oh god <laughs> a particularly bad case of someone being cut in half <laughs> oh god oh yeah <laughs> oh god anybody here seen walk hard the dewey cox story i'm telling you it, it's so funny <laughs> i don't know what made me put it in i uh I just I was looking around for someone watching. Like, ah, I'm going to watch this again. I was 30 seconds into it and said, this was the best decision I could have ever possibly made. And then, of course, into Apocalypse Now, which I don't know if you've seen it or not. It's, it's a little on the dark side. It's just a little dark. And I watched the the director's cut, which has some extra scenes in it. Mm. Oh, man. If you get a chance, please watch <laughs> Walk Hard, The Dewey Cox Story. Maybe I'm the only one. I don't know. If I am, I don't care. I don't care. Uh, somebody used to come in the room a lot. Jeannie Knoll. Her favorite movie is Grease 2. Now I can see Grease being your favorite movie. But Grease 2? It came on the other night and I couldn't. It's Adrian Zemed. Michelle Pfeiffer's in it, but, um... Who else is in that? Maxwell Caulfield. It's just terrible. It's unwatchable. But it's her favorite movie. So. I guess I know what, what people are talking about, but I almost watched uh, Scott Pilgrim again. Um, Terry Lawler says, It's not too bad if the royal family is on repeat, Dolores. Yeah, my sister, my sister Kelly says she wants a cool rider. Yeah. Let's bowl, let's bowl, let's rock and roll. That song, they're just nothing but crap songs in that. 
Diane O'Brien says, Saturday Night Fever is better. It's awful good. And I was also talking to The Wolf last night, and we talked about how, um, and I have it on Blu-ray, Purple Rain. I'm not saying that Purple Rain isn't worth having. It is. Because the music performances in it are spectacular. But as far as the rest of the movie and the story and certainly the acting, it is horrible. It's just, listen, kid, only person cares about your music is yourself. And I can only have three bands. And it's so bad. It is so bad. Hey, Kelly, I thought of you as well. Guess what was on here on Comet? Uh, oh, I think it was last weekend or during the week last week. Kingdom of the Spiders was on. Yes, and I know you're an expert on Kingdom of the Spiders uh, with William Shatner and Woody Strode. The always popular Woody Strode. Um, let's see, meant that for Diana. Yeah, yeah, I got you. Oh, okay, not Dolores, Diana. I got you. The royal family. I've heard that's controversial over there. Uh, but yeah, Kingdom of the Spiders was on. The movie kind of gives me the creeps a little bit. And uh, I don't know if I... Uh, <laughs> Kelly says she has Kingdom of the Spiders on DVD. Well, there is still some hope for you. You don't have it on Blu-ray. Um, uh, since my sister Kelly, my sister is here, I'll go ahead and show her the ring I'm getting. Um, that'll be arriving sometime in February. And, uh, there we go. It's got everything you could possibly want on a ring. Boy, I'm going to be showing that off like a chick that just got an engagement ring. I'm telling you what, I'll be, I'll be gesturing. Hmm, let me see. Well, um, I think yeah, I'll be, I'll be, it'll be awful. It'll be terrible. It'll be terrible. Diane O'Brien says, Oh, the O'Brien household love the royal family. Never get tired of watching it. Never get tired of watching it. My sister Kelly says, I love it. Makes me want to get a school ring. Well, let me, let me get this one. And then I'll let you know how good a job they did and show it off and stuff. And then... The company I got it from is like really highly rated. Everybody that gets they, their their Facebook page is just nothing but compliments, and they get a really high rating. And and uh, yeah, and there's a bunch of different styles and things. And um, Terry Lawler says it's a comedy with Ricky Tomlinson. I believe there's a similar name show, but this one is very funny. Yeah, there there is one that. Maybe it's just called the Royals or something. It just came out. It's very controversial. It's like supposed to be real and, and stuff like that. I'm still wondering if anybody has seen Ted Lasso. I wonder if season three of Ted Lasso has started yet. I just wonder. No, I don't think it is. Ted Lasso is just incredible. First episode was April of 2020. Let's see here. Episodes, production. They said it's going to be a three-season show. It was renewed in October for season three, so they're obviously not ready, ready to start with the third season. So... Um, <laughs> yeah, so people are enjoying whatever on television right now. Um, but, uh, yeah, I got to quit thinking about that ring because it's just making it go slower. You know, it's like I want it now. It, it's not even going to ship. It's not even supposed to ship until fe mid-February. And they say 
a lot of people say, well, it got here way sooner than I thought. Like, it got here two weeks sooner and stuff. So we'll see. But I guarantee you I'll be sporting that thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll be sporting that. I'll be, like I said, like a girl that just got an engagement ring. Mm -hmm. Yes, I will. Um, I don't know if uh, our other sister is aware of this, but I was doing something on Ball State's website or looking at something. I guess there's a legacy scholarship. If you're, if you're the child of someone that, that went to Ball State or graduated from Ball State, you get some sort of scholarship. And I know at least one of my nephews goes to Ball State, I think. Um, pretty sure. Unless I unless I was lied to. But I'm pretty sure one of them does. I don't know why they wouldn't. If I had any children, that's where they'd be going. And uh, no, they would have no choice. But I got a scholarship to Harvard. Well, I hope you can pay for your way there and back and everything else. Because I ain't going to be You're going to buy day. Um, my sister Kelly said, I will let her know. Both of her boys are cardinals. Well, you better let her know. It's probably $10 or something, you know. Well, let me just look it up. I got a couple minutes here. Uh, yeah, there it is. Leg Legacy scholarship. Boom, shakalaka. Um ooh, it says it says selected. Yeah. Alumni achievement, distinguished alumni, honorary alumni. Okay. Alumni Association Legacy Scholarship. Here you go. Uh awarded to selected in-state freshmen and or currently enrolled students who are children or grandchildren of alumni of Ball State University. The scholarships are one time Non-renewable awards. Eh. Recipients must demonstrate success in academics and achievement to receive this scholarship, and they must maintain a cumulative GPA of 2.0 or higher to remain eligible. Um, the Ball State University Alumni Council Alumni Legacy Scholarship Committee meets in February to select recipients for the academic year. They awarded 80 $2,500 scholarships. Well, okay. Those are funded by the Ball State Indiana License Plate Program. <laughs> uh, applications are accepted late October through the first Friday in February each year. So, yeah. Let me see here if I can find anything on... I don't want to contact you. This website kind of sucks sometimes. Search BSU to say Letterman Scholarship. Finding the Letterman Scholarship is like, forget it. It's like, uh, oh, Letterman Telecommunications Scholarship. Be nice if you uh, would list them, wouldn't it? Winner gets 10 grand. First runner up, five grand. Second runner up, $3,333. Well, but where are the li list of the past winners? With my name at the very, very top. Where's that at? No, nowhere. Absolutely nowhere. Bunch of jerks. Well, let me see if it's this one. Now, let's go here. Dave Letterman in Ball State. There's a whole section. Nope, took me back to the same page. It, to see my name uh, listed as the first Letterman Scholar, you have to know the room that the plaque is in, and then you have to get permission to go into the room. It's, it's like a conference room or something in the telecommunications department. <clears throat> Man... Well, let me just put my name in here. I bet you my name isn't even. Let's see if I... Oh, alumni death notices. Oh, that's not me. Jeez. 
What a bunch of hooey. You'd think they'd list them. Uh, man. My sister Kelly says, of course, all three of us worked through college. Well, I was a hall staff, and I um, did get the Letterman Scholarship, which paid for a whole bunch of stuff. But, uh, yeah, thanks. You've got to know what room it's in. It's not, it's, 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 it's off to the side, kind of. And then you got to get permission to go in the room. It's not a room you can just walk into. You believe that? But I'm right there, the first little plate. That's me. I think there's a video I did, a little documentary. I may have taken it off the, off of YouTube, but, um, yeah. If you go into the telecommunications department's office, and, and like you walk by the secretary's desk and keep walking, there's a little like a, the department chairman uses it for a little like conference room or something, so you can't just walk in there. You got to get permission. Hey, can I go in and now? Believe me, permission will not be difficult to get. It's not like, well, I don't know. We don't let people in there. No, she'll go, yeah, go ahead. Go on in. <sighs> what a bunch of hooey. It's like they're hiding it. It's like they're not proud of me or something. I don't know. <laughs> I bet you there was like a meeting in the college of communication, information, and media. All the department chairs were like, about that uh, Letterman plaque. We want to kind of keep that on the hush hush. What for? Yeah, well, Tom Gully's name is on it right at the top. And we're kind of trying to don't really want a lot of people associating. Uh, it's bad enough he wears all the Ball State stuff on his show. That's really the worst publicity we could get. We gave him a pen. We thought that would shut him up, but it didn't. <laughs> Oh, I moved them over there. I've got a bunch of this big stack of alumni magazines over there. Yeah. I'm not going to be in that again either, probably. That ain't going to happen. <laughs> eh, brother. Yeah. Well, what do you expect? But, you know, nobody came to my graduation, so. Let me see here. Yeah. I'm expecting an important email. I might as well check real quick. Um, but uh, if we could just maybe keep that on the hush hush. We uh, I don't know that we want a lot of people knowing that uh, it's just not a good. Uh, you know, and to make matters worse, I have to frequently, you know, tell people who David Letterman is now. There was a, a time when everyone knew now, you know, you got to. He was a guy on television. Um, Jerry Lawler says on, on a change of subject, Tom, I was in a little town called Kong. In, a count, in County Mayo the other day, home of the iconic Quiet Man set. It's so eerie now that COVID has shut everything. Wow, The Quiet Man is one of my favorite movies. No dowry, no marriage. It's not my rule, it's yours. <laughs> he drags her all the way into town. And the one lady, would you like a stick to beat the lovely lady with? Barry Fitzgerald is so great in that. Oh, me pate. My mouth is a dried crust. 
She takes him in and starts just giving him whiskey. Diana Bryant says, television presenter, talk show host. Yes, Tom. Yeah, good old Dave. Yes, I was the first recipient of the David Letterman Scholarship for creativity. I'm sure they've taken the for creativity part off of it. <laughs> also due to me. Uh, we, just, we just gave that one out, man. My loving mother refused to believe that I had won it. That was nice. No amount of persuading. No, I won. I, you did not. Yes, I did. I had to repeat it five times. Terry Lawler says, and the priest and vicar getting the outcome of the great fight. Oh, yeah. And uh, the bishop coming in and betting the vicar. Here you are, Snuffy. Twenty dollars. He bet him on the fight. <laughs> I love the picture of the vicar. I was a boxer too, you know. And they showed it to him, and he's 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 in the unitard doing this. Yeah, they're betting like crazy. I love it when Ward Bond. Uh, they're they're trying to convince uh, Danaher. Will Danaher to, that uh, that Sean Thornton is going after his lady. And, well, I won't say it's true, and I can't say it's not, but there's been talk. <laughs> there's been talk. He's trying not to lie so bad. Uh, Diana Ryan says, I love Irish comedy in films. Yeah, it's great. Well, it's Sean Thornton. He's been paying her visits. Is this true? Well, I can't say it's true, and I won't say it's not, but there's been talk. <laughs> oh, and when he, uh, when he, when uh, Barry Fitzgerald Danaher was a fine English Irishman, <laughs> yes, he was. Uh, when um, Barry Fitzgerald goes to let um, oh Margaret O'Hara know that. John Wayne's interested in her. And she's, you know, just vile-tongued at him. Well, in that case, I won't be telling you about blah, blah, blah. And she's, oh, what did he say? Oh, I tell you, but out in the sun here, me pate. Oh, oh, my mouth is like a dried crust. We have some whiskey inside. <laughs> That's a great movie. <coughs> That's a great movie. Oh, it's a great movie. Anyway, The Quiet Man. If you haven't seen it, see it. My sister Kelly's probably seen it. Uh, Diana Bryan says Australian films are good too. Yes, some of them are. Every country's got some good movies. Oh, me pate. Her mouth is like a dried crust. <laughs> Uh, goes in, he sees the bed's broken from where John Wayne threw her on it. Impetuous. <laughs> There'll be no doors between us, Mary Kate, except in your own treacherous little heart. It's called a sleeping bag. It's a bag you sleep in. Uh, that's a great film. John Ford directed wonderful film. And I saw a documentary on it on the uh, VHS copy I had. And apparently everybody on that movie got along great. It was the most wonderful time. They all had just an incredibly great time making the movie. Yeah. Terry Lawler says Aussie movies are very good, but you have to give it to the Chinese. Those boyos can fight. <laughs> hey, guys with black hair, let's fight. There's a huge wall with just covered in Chinese writing. Says there'll be a big tournament today. <laughs> Is that all it says? Is that all it says? It looks like it says everything that's ever been said. But anyway. Oh, boy. We've got about 20 seconds until we crank this baby up into network programming. Boy, are we going to have us a time. 
It's going to be a hoot nanny. I hey, you know, I I, I I don't like to promise. I don't like to overpromise on this show, but I'm pretty sure this one's going to be a a hoot nanny. Really. Underestimate someone who knows his place, unlike Tom Gully. Ooh, the social airplane that is Tom Gully. Ooh, I'm going now to get my gully. Tom Gully. Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have your attention? I've just been handed an urgent and horrifying news story. And I need all of you to stop what you're doing and listen. What is your motto here? Boys, inform on your classmates. Save your hide. Anything short of that, we're going to burn you at the stake? Warriors, come out to play. Oh, you all talk big. But who here has the guts to stop me? Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Is this not why you are here? Ladies and gentlemen, and children of all ages, prepare for entertainment. It's time for the Tom Gully Show. And now, here he is, a very special man, Tom Gully. I am Tom Gully, and I am a very special man. I'm so special, I once beat up Will Danaher. It's true. You can look it up. Hey, thanks for watching us here on Facebook Live. You might have heard about it on the Tom Gully Show Facebook page. You might have heard about it on SonicAsylumRadio.com's Facebook page. Or you might have heard about it in a secret side anteroom in the Ball State Department of Telecommunications area. Hard to say. Uh, you might be listening to us on KCTK Radio, rawtalkonline.com, or on uh, Midnight Joker Radio, or on Tomorrow Radio, or on iHeart Radio. Hard to say. As always on this program, you can call in at any time with any question or any topic or any subject, including but not limited to automotive, lawn and garden, home improvement, personal relationships, and of course, the ever-popular hygiene. Trolls are welcome on this show, as well as good-loving people like yourself. All you got to do is call the number at the bottom of the screen, 817-522-3948. And if you're listening, that number once again, 817-522-3948. We've got great news stories for you today. Apparently, they're going to execute a woman. You might not be in favor of that, but when you find out what this woman did, you're going to be in favor of that. We'll also tell you about a man who stabbed someone at Walmart due to a milk price check. I'm not joking. And we'll tell you the best Saturday Night Live skits of all time. And now, without further ado, musical fanfare. Boy, that's good fanfare. At any rate, as usual, we have the finest human beings in the history of mankind on Earth in our YouTube chat room. They've been here percolating in our bonus content exclusive YouTube pre-show, which starts a little over an hour before this, our network program every day. We have Terry Lawler, the King of Ireland. We have Diana O'Brien from Across the Pond. We have uh, my sister Kelly, my sister, it's my sister. Morty Vicker, the Sultan of the Outdoor Grill, is with us. Thomas Hamilton from uh, Glasgow, Scotland, is here. He's a great lad. He's one of our mates. Uh, Dolores Colbert, international woman of mystery, is here. Midnight Shepherd was with us a little earlier. And who else? There's probably other people that I'm overlooking and and for that, I feel shame. Deep, permanent, absolutely caustic, soul-rotting shame 
from places, frankly, I didn't think I could feel shame anymore. All right. Uh, let's pick up our comments uh, from the pre-show. Let's see. Terry Lawler says, do you know the actual set was offered of The Quiet Man? We were talking about the John Wayne movie, The Quiet, Quiet Man. The actual set was offered to the Irish government who turned it down, so it was demolished. Well, you'd have thought one of the one of the big movie studios or somebody would have said, this is going to be a great tourist attraction. That's terrible. Uh, Diane O'Brien says, Tom is on form tonight. Well, so this is the night. I'm glad... Uh, Glad somebody thinks so. Terry Lawler says, ha ha, it must have been Will Danaher, the local idiot, Tom. Uh, Diana Bryan says, enlighten me, who is Will Danaher, please? Well, Diana Bryan, in the story, The Quiet Man, the movie, okay, um, John Wayne plays an American, former boxer, who was born in uh, White Amorn. Okay, and he returns there because he was a prize fighter and had the money to do it. And his name's Sean Thornton. Okay, uh, so he's a retired boxer from Pittsburgh. He also worked in the steel mills. Okay, so he meets quite by accident Mary Kate Danaher, who's played by uh, Marino Sullivan, uh, Marino Harris, excuse me. And um, her brother is Red Will Danaher, and he's played by Victor McLaughlin. And so he doesn't like John Wayne because he wanted his family farm. He wanted the land that, that John Wayne bought. And so that's why he doesn't like him. So... You know, the property, the widow Tulane sold the property to John Wayne. She felt he should have it because it was his family's ancestral property. And um, Will Danaher actually is kind of sweet on the widow Tulane, but, but he's too um, confident that she's going to go for him because he thinks he's all that. So... They they clash all the way through. There's an issue of the dowry, and John Wayne doesn't care about the dowry, but it means a lot to the Irish girl because it's it's a custom. And um, finally, <laughs> let's just say the end of the movie. There is the battle royal of battle royals. John Wayne fighting Red Will Danaher, and it's funny. It's great. It's a wonderful film. Diane O'Brien, if you have not seen The Quiet Man. I recommend that you watch it on Netflix or something tonight. You will love it. It is charming. It is uh, romantic. It is funny. And it's very, very Irish. Very Irish. <laughs> I love the scene where John Wayne comes in and the, the uh, pub is completely quiet. And people are giving him dirty looks. And uh, he comes in and, and uh, you know, the barkeep w manages to wheedle out of him the information that he's, uh, would you be the son of John Thornton, you know? And they find out that he was born there and is a descendant. And then everybody starts singing and drinking. Well, then, the men of Whittlesbury do welcome you. <laughs> it's great. Diana Bryant said, yes, I've seen it. Now I remember when I was a kid, I watched John Wayne movies. Maureen O'Hare was beautiful and funny. Boy, is she a looker in that movie. Even when he's just dragging her across the countryside, she loses her shoe. Micheline is a great character in it. Oh, Micheline O'Flynn, played by Barry Fitzgerald. He is. He is. Oh, me pate. My, my mouth is like a dried crust. <laughs> He's doing anything to get drunk. <coughs> anything to get drunk at all times. So if you haven't seen The Quiet Man, we were we were all talking about it in our pre-show. And 
I wish that I had that on DVD or Blu-ray. I used to have it on VHS, but I got rid of it. And it's on a lot. You can see it on a lot. So I, I should just wait until it comes on. But, uh, <laughs> it's a good movie. Uh, I can't say it's true and I won't say it's not. But there's been talk. It's like a movie of our family. I don't kid you, says Diana. <laughs> I bet you're right. I, I don't think they've made... My sister Kelly's probably not still here, but I don't think they've made any movies about our family. The closest one I can imagine would be uh, The Great Santini, maybe? Uh, yeah. Here, here, here's, here's an actual quote from one of our family gatherings. Okay, Hogs. I've listened to you bellyache about moving to this new town. This said bellyaching will end as a 1530 hours. Will not affect the morale of the squadron his fourth. Do I make myself clear? Yes, yes sir. sir. I know it's rough to leave your friends and move every year. But you are marine kids and can chew nails while other kids are sucking cotton candy. Yeah, that's, that's my own father right there. I don't, I don't think, uh, I think they made any movies similar to my family. Which is probably a good thing. Probably a good thing. Mm. It's probably a good thing. Terry Lawler says they don't do courting like that anymore. I'll be there when you do the walking and the talking. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. What what do they call him? Uh, let me see if I can find out. Micheline. And you, Micheline O'Flynn. I can remember you from when I was blah, blah, blah. Uh, let's see here. What, what's, what's he say he is? Matchmaker. Matchmaker. No, there's an official name. I am the Shukra, or whatever he says he is. Um, boy, oh boy. Micheline Og Flynn. It's, it's, it's a great cast, too. I, I'm i not familiar enough with the, um, you know, the stock and trade of uh, British actors in the early 1950s, but I imagine there's a lot of them in there. Um... No fortune, no marriage. Uh, <laughs> yep. Uh, what did he call himself? I'll be the one to watch while you do no patty fingers, please. I'll be the one to do the walking and the talk. Oh, dear. Diana Bryant says, I love all the old satire. Morty Vickers says, The Quiet Man is free. On Amazon Prime Video. Uh, Diane says that uh, cracks me up. He's like the chauffeur. He is, but he's also kind of like um, a yenta, a matchmaker. He's, he's there to see that all, with all the proprieties. You know? With all the proprieties. Making patty fingers in the communion water. In the holy water. No patty fingers, please. <laughs> and that's about enough with that. Well, hey, I tell you what, why don't we do the news? Uh, we do that from time to time here. And then uh, maybe we'll talk about other stuff later. I don't know. I don't know what goes on with this show. Let's just do the news, shall we? The award winning Tom Gully Show news team has been hard at work. Let's see what they have for us, shall we? Uh <laughs> Uh, screwed up my sound clip. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, new software from Apple. All right. Now, I don't know how you feel about capital punishment, but they're supposedly getting close to executing a, a lady, and I don't know, normally not in favor of that, but when you hear about this, you're probably going to be in favor of it. You're probably going to be in favor. 
Probably. This is from uh, Mission, Kansas. Becky Harper sobbed as she spoke to a Missouri dispatcher after stumbling across her pregnant daughter in a pool of blood, her wound slashed open, and the child she had been carrying missing. It's like she exploded or something, Harper, Harper told the dispatcher on December 16, 2004. During the desperate yet futile attempt to get help for her daughter, Bobby Jo Stinnett, who had been eight months pregnant. Lisa Montgomery, who strangled Stinnett with a rope before performing a crude cesarean and fleeing with the baby, awaits execution tomorrow, just eight days before the presidential inauguration of death penalty opponent Joe Biden. If the lethal injection is carried out as scheduled at the Federal Correctional Complex in Terre Haute, Indiana, I've been there many times, Montgomery would be the first woman executed by the federal government in about six decades. Montgomery drove about 170 miles from her Melvern, Kansas farmhouse to the northwest Missouri town of Skidmore under the guise of adopting a rat terrier puppy from Stinnett, a 23-year-old dog breeder. She was arrested the next day after showing off the premature infant, Victoria Joe, as her own. The girl is 16 years old and hasn't spoken publicly about the tragedy. As we walked across the threshold, our Amber Alert was scrolling across the TV that that very moment recalled Randy Strong, who was part of the Northwest Missouri Major Case Squad at the time. He looked to his right and saw Montgomery holding the newborn and was awash in relief when she handed the baby over to law enforcement. The preceding hours had been a blur in which he photographed Stinnett's body and spent a sleepless night looking for clues, unsure of whether the baby was dead or alive and having no idea what the baby looked like. But then tips began arriving about Montgomery, who had a history of faking pregnancies, who suddenly had a baby. Strong, now the sheriff of Nodaway County, where the killing happened, hopped in an unmarked car with another officer. He learned while en route that the email address fisherforkids at hotmail.com that was used to set up the deadly meeting with Stinnett had been sent from a dial-up connection at Montgomery's home. Prosecutors said her motive was that her ex-husband knew she had undergone a tubal ligation that made her sterile and planned to reveal she was lying about being impregnant in an effort to get custody of two of their four children. Needing a baby before a fast-approaching court date, Montgomery turned her focus on Stinnett, whom she had met at dog shows. Montgomery's lawyers, though, have argued that sexual abuse during Montgomery's childhood led to mental illness. Her stepfather denied the sexual abuse in videotaped testimony and said he didn't have a good memory when confronted with a transcript of a divorce proceeding in which he admitted some physical abuse. Man, oh man. Man, oh man. Montgomery was originally scheduled to be put to death on December 8th, but the execution was temporarily blocked after her attorneys contacted the, excuse me, contracted the coronavirus visiting her in prison. The resumption of federal executions after a 17-year pause started on July 14th. Anti-death penalty groups said President Donald Trump was pushing for executions prior to the November election in a cynical bid to burnish a reputation as a law and order leader. So there we go. Uh, there, there are comments on this story. Um, I'm sure they're not very pleasant. Um, she needs to die. Uh, it's a disgrace to our criminal justice system that this woman is still alive. Um, I'm not normally a supporter of the death penalty, but this is one case that I will make an exception for. Um, one of the few media articles that doesn't make the perpetrator a victim. Um, mentally ill, she was able to carry on with daily activities, including thoroughly... Um, yeah. All I can say is it's about time... Uh, yeah, yeah, people are just like, hey, man, she's got, hey, she had it coming, you know what I mean? Hey, she had it coming. Um, Randy Ramos says he liked the movie The Shootist, 
This is a good movie. John Wayne's last movie, if I'm not mistaken. Diana Bryant says, oh my God, I heard about her. Absolutely horrendous. There is no excuse for committing such a crime. No, there is not. <sighs> Speaking of no excuse, <clears throat> police arrested a man in Connecticut. Oh boy, it's going to take me to another page. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait, let me just do that. Oh, that ain't going to work. Hold on a second, folks. Police arrest... Uh, yeah, yeah. Let's start over, shall we? Police arrested a man in Connecticut who allegedly stabbed a Walmart staff member after she scanned his milk and told him how much it cost. Paramedics arrived at the Mart Walmart location on Sunday after getting a call about the assault. Authorities say the man was stabbed by another man who was still at the store. Allegedly, a 40-year-old Hickman Asper grabbed a 19-year-old cashier. Reports say he scanned a gallon of milk and told him how much money was due. After he told him the cost, Asper allegedly walked around the register, grabbed the cashier, stabbed him on the side of his head. Asper sat down right after stabbing her. The cashier was sent to St. Mary's Hospital and is expected to recover as for is arrested and being charged with assault and breach of the peace. Why would you, I mean, why would, why would the price of milk, you know what I mean? Terry Lawler says an eye for an eye. Yeah, I mean, she's, why is it taking 16 years? You know, it's, it's, I don't know. Mm hmm. Anybody remember Judge Mills Lane? You might not remember him as a judge. What you might remember him as is a boxing ref. He he officiated, I think, the Tyson ear biting and stuff. He would be he'd be like, you know, break clean and protect yourself at all times. Do you understand? Do you understand? Let's get it on. He'd always go, let's get it on. Okay, so he was an actual judge. He had a TV show for a while. It was sort of like a Judge uh, Judy show. Um, I don't know if he's still alive or not. Yes, he is. He's 83. Judge Mills Lane um, was a two-term uh, Washoe County, Nevada district court judge. So he was an actual judge, right? And... Um, they asked him about the death penalty. They said they asked him, uh, yeah, Morty Vicker remembers. Let's get it on. He was originally from Georgia, Savannah, Georgia. Um, that's how, why he had that accent. But they asked him if the death penalty was a deterrent. And he said, well, all I can tell you is it deters one fella real good. <laughs> uh, Anybody here watch Saturday Night Live? I know a lot of people are going to say Saturday Night Live isn't as funny as it used to be and that they don't like it anymore and blah, blah, blah. I would agree. Overall, the quality is not as high as it used to be. However, there's still a couple good sketches every show. And if uh, they have a really great guest, the whole show can be fabulous. Well, these are the top 25 Saturday Night Live skits ever. Uh, number 30, actually the top 30. I don't know why it says top 25 and starts with 30, but maybe we'll find out. Uh, Randy Ramos is getting ready for new Jeopardy with uh, Ken Downey. I don't know what his name is. Uh, say goodnight, Gracie. Good night, Gracie. I love Debbie Downer. I think Debbie Downer is funny. It's uh, Rachel Dratch's Debbie Downer is one of the funniest characters in Saturday Night Live history. One of her most notable moments came with a group at Disney World. <laughs> Lowen's, uh, Debbie brings down the gang while visiting the happiest place on earth. Uh, Lindsay Lowen's character eventually goes off on Debbie about bringing this family reunion down on topics such as low birth weight in regards to it's a small world and feline AIDS. Even better, Dratch, Lowen, and fellow cast member Jimmy Fallon could not stop laughing during the skit. <laughs> low birth weight uh single ladies number 29 
Fans of SNL should know that Justin Timberlake has delivered just about every time he showed up. JT teamed up with Andy Samberg and Bobby Moynihan to provide backup dancing for Beyonce during their filming of the popular Single Ladies video. While all three male dancers were brilliantly funny in their own way, Timberland was, Timberlake was the star of the sketch, proving that he can shine in any form of entertainment. That was a hilarious sketch. It really was. All right, what do we got here? Uh, Morty Vickers says, The Claymation? I believe it was actually him. Clay Animation. Oh, yeah, Deathmatch? I think he might have done that voice. I could probably look it up and find out, but... Uh, Natalie's Rap and Natalie's Rap 2.0. I do remember this. It was great. Oscar-winning actress Natalie Portman is obviously known for her often excellent dramatic work. That's why her out-of-character, edgy, raunchy rap on SNL in 2009 was a monster hit, especially since she talked about smoking weed and cheating on tests while at Harvard. After becoming a mother, Portman kept up her behind-the-scenes hardcore ways with the 2018 sequel, Give Andy Samberg and the Lonely Island comedy troupe much credit for making it so good. I remember that first one. It was great. It was great. Well, that's a. I hate it when they show these smoking hot pictures that are obviously ads for something that won't have anything about the smoking hot picture in it. See, now this one's going to. I don't know if I agree with this next one. Uh, that's the one, Morty. Yes, looked it up. It was him playing himself. Yeah, I, th I thought it was. Um, he, Judge Mills was a funny guy. He didn't take himself too seriously. He was a good guy. SNL had its moments while attempting virtual comedy during the COVID-19 pandemic. One of them was Brad Pitt's take as infectious disease star Anthony Fauci during the cold open. Uh, you know, okay. If you say so, I... I think that's a too easy of a pick. Can I show you guys a picture here? Look at the middle picture. How am I supposed to pass that up? I'm gonna, but I mean, it's not easy or fun. White like me. One of the more memorable Eddie Murphy moments came when he decided to go undercover as a white man. Looking a little Harry Reams-ish, Murphy's Mr. White noticed that when white people are alone, they give each other things for free. It was party time on public transportation, and white people can even get free money from banks. It's a sketch that probably flew under the radar for those of a certain age, but certainly worth a spot on the list. White Like Me is one of the funniest, one of the funniest sketches ever on Saturday Night Live. You should definitely look it up. You really should. Uh, the Olympia Cafe. This is with the original Not Ready for Primetime Players. There's John Belushi and and the gang and there's Dan Aykroyd and Bill Murray. And reportedly inspired by Chicago's famed Billy Goat Tavern, Still in operation. The John Belushi-led sketch was a staple of those early Saturday Night Live years. The Olympia Cafe is a popular restaurant known only for its cheeseburger, 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 cheap, no fries, Pepsi, no Coke. Uh, the sketch, which also featured Bill Murray and Dan Aykroyd, was first introduced in early 1978. Veteran actor Robert Klein had a little trouble trying to order breakfast in the debut. Man, I remember that. Cheeseburger, cheeseburger, cheeseburger. And can I get some uh, fries with that? Cheap, no fry. Jaws 2, the debut of the famous Land Shark. Anybody here but me remember Land Shark? Land Shark. Unsuspecting women answered the door. On the other side was the Land Shark posing as a plumber or delivering the likes of a telegram or candygram, only to become the prey of the deadly land shark, voiced by Chevy Chase. A play on the Jaws movies, the skit was an instant hit. The character was revised often during the show's run. However, the initial appearance in Stevens 1, featuring the lights of Lorraine Newman, Jane Curtin, Gilda Radner, and host Candace Bergen, remains the best. The land shark would always come in. Land shark? What? What was that? Uh, candygram. <laughs> They'd finally open the door and the land shark. I loved Land Shark. It was really good. 
Uh, Terry Lawler says those contestants really got the. Oh yeah, death match was great. Dolores Colbert says yes, Land Shark. Well, this one they even made a movie out of, and that of course would be the Coneheads. The Coneheads. Plenty of SNL sketches and characters turned into movies. While the Coneheads film from the early 1990s was lukewarm, the debut of the Alien Family from 1977 remains the gold standard. Parents Beldar and Primat and daughter Connie are known for their obviously pointed heads and strange voices. And they would eat... What would they eat? They would eat eggs, fried eggs, and like Polaroid film or something weird like that. Um, yeah, you got to look into the Coneheads. Oh, and they also enjoyed eating raw pumpkins. Um, they'd act re- that, like they were trying to fit into society. It was funny. Oh, the Culps. The Culps. I'm going to show them to you because you might not know them by their name. Remember the Culps? Um, the first time we bring Will Ferrell into the mix, he starred as straight-laced Marty Culp along with wife Bobby, Anna Gasmeyer, and their music instructors at Altadena Middle School. Their conservative, almost church-like renditions of pop and rap songs make for numerous laughs. The highlight of the Culp's run came on the show when they embarrassed their daughter during a career day performance. They they would, uh, oh God, they would try and do these hip-hop and rap songs that were just so square. Um, oh boy. Aluminum cans. They would also eat like strip, like no pest strips or something, you know. Who remembers Rosanne, Rosanna, Dana? Rosanne, Rosanna, Dana. The late, great Gilda Radner is one of the truly special comedians and has the legacy to prove it. Perhaps her most memorable SNL character was Roseanne Rosanna Dana. Roseanne's first appearance came during a 1977 sketch about a fired restaurant employee, which was quite the scene while her long hair couldn't keep from falling on the grill. While the character became a weekend update staple, Roseanne's debut was pretty... Unforgettable. You should hire the incompetent. It's always something. Oh, boy. Hey, there's uh, the Honorable Jen Coffey, who appears on uh, Matt Connerton Unleashed. First of all, I don't know why anyone would have leashed him to begin with. And he seems relatively leashed to me. I love his show, don't get me wrong, but it, I'm not getting an unleashed feel from that program. Um, I just don't. How about this one? King Tut. Steve Martin's Ode to King Tut for the uh, Teuton Common Exhibit, which was traveling through the United States, is legendary in Saturday Night Live history. The song and dance sketch, which is that kind of got a disco feel to it, became somewhat of a phenom at the time. Lost in the skit has often been the inclusion of famed saxophonist Blue Lou Marini, naturally featured in gold paint sporting Egyptian guard. Now, when I was a young boy, I never thought I'd see the people stand in line to see the boy King, King Tut. But how'd you get so funky, King Tut? You know, you, you guys, you younger, just go ahead. Dolores Colbert says King Tut is still a classic. It is. It is. Uh oh. Keeping on the Steve Martin theme, two wild and crazy guys with our bulges, with your large American breasts. Uh, the legendary comedian team with Dan Aykroyd to form the Festrunk Brothers, otherwise known as Two Wild and Crazy Guys, brothers George and Yortuck first appeared in 1977 and usually showed up when Martin was on hand to host the show. Their skit from January 1978, hanging in their apartment, provided plenty of laughs, especially when Garrett Morris's Cliff stopped by for a non-PC visit. Man, that Two Wild and Crazy Guys thing went 
went over the top, right? Diana Bryan said, Steve Martin, hilarious. Um, these two guys just want to pump you up. Hans and Franz, um, cousins of Arnold Schwarzenegger. And then there was the one where Schwarzenegger actually showed up during the skit, which was hilarious. Uh, let's see here. Uh-oh. Sarah Palin and Hillary Clinton address the nation with uh, Tina Fey and uh, uh, Amy Poehler. Um, yeah. So there you go. There's another one. What was that? Number 17, Mr. Roberts. If you guys haven't seen Eddie Murphy doing Mr. Robinson's Neighborhood on Saturday Night Live, you haven't lived. Uh, Terry Lawler says, Greatest American Hero, one of the best shows ever to come this side of Atlantic. Greatest American Hero? Are you talking about William Cat? Look at what's happening to me. I can't believe it myself. Suddenly I'm on top of the world. That's on Saturday mornings here. It's got Robert Culp in it, too. And uh, Connie Selica. A play on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, one of Eddie Murphy's great characters who had a solid shelf life on the show, the poverty-stricken Mr. Robertson liked to give viewers an interesting vocabulary lesson each time he stopped by for a visit. One of Mr. Roberts Robinson's better moments came during a Christmas 1984 sketch where he faced eviction and tried make, making money by selling fake Cabbage Patch Kids. Dressing up as Santa Claus to avoid his landlord seeing him was an all-time moment. Yeah, the rent control. Oh, God. Oh, man, he's some, they did a pretty good job with this list, I have to say. Okay, Wayne's World with Aerosmith. Do we even need to go through Wayne's World? Wayne's World, Wayne's World, party time, excellent. And then Aerosmith actually showed up. Um, and, and did, they did their own version of the Wayne's World theme. Uh, Garth told C Steven Tyler, bitch and lips. Uh, hamburger, hamburger, no pizza. Well, gin, coffee, it was cheap burger, cheap burger. No pizza, coke. No fries, cheaps. Yeah, we just did that, the Olympia Cafe. That was earlier in the list. Sorry. Oh, my God. Nick the Lounge Singer. These pictures do not match necessarily what they're discussing. Bill Murray, one of Bill Murray's great NS SNL characters, Nick Winters, pleased the crowd at the Powder Room at Meatloaf Mountain. In this particular sketch with Paul Schaefer on the piano, Nick offered a spirited rendition of the Star Wars theme, which we didn't know had any words. And it was Star Wars, those crazy Star Wars. He sings the Star Wars song. It's pure Bill Murray, and it is pure genius. And look at, on, look at it on YouTube. Um, Sean Spicer, oh boy, I loved it when Melissa McCarthy did Sean Spicer. It was spicy. It was so hilarious. Um no, no press secretary was more entertaining than Sean Spicer. Melissa McCarthy's take on the hilariously volatile Spicer is over the top, yet spot on. It's made even funnier by playing to Spicer's and the administration's incompetence. The aggressive podium moves might have been a little too much, but it's, it's certainly a side-splitting good time. And the gum, just all the gum he was putting in his mouth. Spicy doesn't do that. Uh, this one here, Omeletteville. I don't even remember this one, and uh, therefore I don't like it, and I'm not entertaining it. Uh, Dolores Colbert says she was great as Spicer. Oh my God, these uh, Kate McKinnon, the Kate McKinnon series, and there's like six of them of alien abductions where the first two people always have this transcensional experience and and uh, she has some really white trash. Uh, Jen Coffey says, no way the podium rocked. I didn't think it was over the top. I thought it was great when it went down the, the street and when he was running into stuff. and <laughs> Or she. 
Alien abduction is not the same for everybody, especially Ms. Rafferty, Kate McKinnon. Her telling of the experience is salaciously descriptive. Smoking a cigarette and drinking coffee while speaking with an investigative panel, she stands out among co-stars Cecily Strong and Ryan Gosling, who can't help but break up during the scene. The latter's backside gets a good workout from McKinnon's character. It's another example of McKinnon at her best and why she remains the star of the show. Oh, man. Just, uh... <laughs> when she always, she always like, uh, you know, and so I'm hanging in the breeze. So my gravy maker and baby shaker are hanging out in the breeze. I mean, she, she's she got some of the better, best, uh, ad, the lines are hilarious. I, I can watch these alien abduction skits forever. Oh, boy. In ode to the uh, recently departed Alex Trebek, Celebrity Jeopardy with Sean Connery. A uh, popular sketch from 96 to 2015 with Will Ferrell portraying coast Alex Trebek. Most laughs are usually drawn when Sean Connery is a contestant. Played by Daryl Hammond, Connery offers those barbs and shade at Trebek often about Trebek's mother. <laughs> Perhaps none better with a buzzed Kathy Lee Gifford and clueless Tom Hanks as himself and a cameo by Burt Reynolds alongside, uh, played by um, oh, Norm MacDonald. And, and, and Norm MacDonald had written on the front of his thing, he was playing Burt Reynolds, it just said Turd Ferguson. Uh, Dolores Colbert says, yeah, the podium was great. Uh, Terry Lawler says, my wife introduced me to the American Pie series. Only watched it to buckle in laughs at the Stifler character. Yeah, Stifler's, Stifler's mom. Hey, now. Um, okay, this is one of my favorite skits ever. Um, Justin Timberlake, Andy Samberg, for the memorably funny SNL digital short, Dick in a Box which originated in December 2016. Andy Samberg and Rafe Timberlake are a couple of smooth R&B pop crooners offering a song to their girlfriends. That is, complete with each featuring a wrapped Christmas box present over their respective private area. The song and sketch was a viral smash and followed by sequels Mother Lover and Three Way, The Golden Rule. Uh, Dolores Colbert says, saw Ken... Host Jeopardy today. Jen Coffey says, oh my God, I forgot about that one. Dick in a box. <laughs> I got, and uh, Susan Sarandon and that Laura Linney or somebody played the uh, moms. Oh God, just hilarious. I got a dick in a box. Oh man. One of Chris Farley's greatest moments. Let me see if I can get on here. The Chippendale sketch with Patrick Squazy. Oh, yeah. What's this doing to me here? I'm not enjoying that. Come on. I guess I got to... Oh, it says Chippendales. There we go. Looking back on this famous skit featuring guest host Patrick Swayze and Chris Farley, it's still hard to believe both are gone. Swayze's chiseled Adrian and Farley's portly Barney were competitively in the running for a job as a Chippendales male dancer. That premise alone was comedy gold. When both started dancing during their audition, the laughs got even louder. Great work between two stars who were taken far too soon. That, that, that sketch, you cannot watch that sketch without cracking up. You just can't. I'm sorry. Uh, Ken Jennings, yes. Buckwheat Dead, America Mourns. Eddie Murphy always played Buckwheat. Um, another classic Eddie Murphy character from the 70s. That's why it was hard to see the famed Little Rascal's personality assassinated by one John David Stutz, who in high school was voted most likely to kill Buckwheat. <laughs> Told in a breaking news motif, the story of Buckwheat's death and this assassin is really beyond hilarious. Uh, one middle-aged fans of the show would want to want to relive. That's number seven, by the way. Ken Jennings was just okay. Okay, nah. Ken Copy says just everything with Eddie was awesome. I'm gumbid, damn it. 
Lazy Sunday. Remember Lazy Sunday? Uh, Andy Samberg and Chris Parnell. Sunday adventures told in Manhattan via rap, sleeping late, hitting Magnolia Bakery, then catching the Chronicles of Narnia. Remember, Mr. Pibb and Renvides equal crazy delicious. Oh, yeah, the Chronicles of Narnia. That, that is a funny, funny bit. Funny, funny bit. Uh, not a bad list. Spartan cheerleaders. Oh, man. Perhaps the funniest thing about Craig and Ariana, Will Ferrell and Sherry Otelier, was that they never actually made the East Lake Spartans high school cheerleading team. It didn't, however, dampen their school spirit. Introduced in late 1995, the pair are full of energy and don't really care how they look. While the pair remained a staple within the ranks of SNL for four years, their first appearance at a football game really stands out. Remember the cheerleaders? My name is Craig. I've got a... <laughs> you, you guys get it. You, yeah, you guys know the whole thing. You, you, you know the drill. Yeah. Oh, man. This is one of my favorite ever, ever, ever sketches on Saturday Night Live. It's the synchronized swimming sketch with Martin Short and Harry Shearer. Doris Colbert's laughing at I'm Gumby, damn it. Uh, you, you've lost me with this list. Well, you know, you can always look up some of these sketches. You will die laughing, especially with this synchro. It's the first male synchronized swimming list. And as you can see, Martin Short here is wearing a life jacket. I'm not a strong swimmer. <laughs> They're synchronized swimmers. Going back to the 80s, Harry Shearer and Martin Short play unathletic brothers who attempt to become Olympic synchronized swimmers, even though the men's version of the sport was not in the Olympic program. Short's character was the most memorable. His notable line that, I'm not that strong a swimmer. Christopher Guest, as the brother's routine choreographer, foreshadows his take as Corky in the stellar Waiting for Guffman. Oh, man, is that funny. We're almost done with the list, Diana. So we'll we'll get you back on track here in no time. Oh, oh my God. More cowbell. More cowbell. Oh, do I have a cowbell clip here somewhere? Oh, hold on a second. Hold on. Oh, here we go. That, that, it doesn't work for me. I got to have more cowbell. Can I just say one thing? Yeah, baby, just say it. I'm staring here and staring at rock legend Bruce Dickinson. I'm a cock and a walk, baby. And if Bruce Dickinson wants more cowbell, we should probably give him more cowbell. Say, it, baby. And Bobby, you are right. I am being selfish. But the last time I checked, we don't have a whole lot of songs that feature the cowbell. I gotta have more cowbell, baby. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I gotta have. I got the fever, and the only prescription. Is more cowbell. <laughs> okay, uh, you're gonna you're gonna just go crazy for this one. It's this is a good list. I am officially endorsing this list. Is it perfect? I, I can't. I don't know if I can say that, but it's a good list. Sweaty balls. Sweaty balls. Delicious dish was usually a big hit with the SNL faithful. Margaret Joe, Anna Gasteyer, and Terry, Molly Shannon, were quite funny on their own. They parody an NPR show, which I could do so easily. Trust me. I oh. Anyway, however, when shop owner Pete Schweddy, Alec Baldwin, enters the fray, whose store makes delectable Christmas treats, the last never stops. He's known for his balls. That is... Popcorn balls, cheese balls, etc. Of course, the innuendo-based dialogue is what makes the sketch a classic. Even better, all three actors kept character throughout. Good times, good times. What did I... Wait, did I miss Margot smelling her armpits? Superstar! I don't know. We're, we're down to the number one sketch. And if they left, they left her out, sometimes I put my... Smell them. Yeah, if, if they left that out, that's bad. But 
Superstar. Oh, boy. I think they did hit a home run with the number one. And now, without further ado, Matt Foley, motivational speaker. When talking Chris Farley in Saturday Night Live, Matt Foley, I am Matt Foley, uh, tends to be the first character who comes to mind. The unhinged, overzealous, motivational speaker Foley was first introduced to fans in 1993. The 35-year-old divorcee who lives in a van down by the river gave his unforgettable spiel to a couple of misguided teens, David Spade and Christine Applegate. Spade had a hard time keeping a straight face as Foley went off, ultimately falling into the coffee table. It remains one of the most memorable moments in the show's history and one that we feel stands out among the rest. I think I do have some Matt Foley here. Uh, let's see here. Now, as your father probably told you, my name is Matt Foley, and I am a motivational speaker. Now, let's get started by letting me give you a little bit of a scenario of what my life is all about. First off, I am 35 years old. I am divorced, and I live in a van down by the river. There you go. Here's now, a young man, what do you want to do with your life? Uh, actually, Matt, I kind of want to be a writer. Well, Lottie frickin' God! We got ourselves a writer here. Hey, Dad, I can't see real good. Is that Bill Shakespeare over there? Huh? Well, actually, Matt, uh, Ellen and I have encouraged Brian in his writing. Dad, I wish you could just shut your big yapper! <laughs> oh, this is pretty good. You're going to be doing a lot of do here, here. from what I've heard. Here you go. Uh, Young uh, lady, what do you want to do with your life? I want to live in a van down by the river. Well, you'll have plenty of time to live in a van down by the river when you're living in a van down by the river. <laughs> uh, who doesn't love Matt Foley? Uh, <laughs> let's see. Uh, <laughs> Jen Coffey says, yes, yes, about shakes his head off his body and doing the thing with his belt constantly. Well, Lottie, freaking... I probably will get dinged for that. I probably will have to... They'll make me edit that out of the show or something. I, uh, but so be it. I don't care. It was worth it. Um, but yeah, uh, Matt Foley, incredible. Uh, although Superstar, they made a movie about her, by the way, about that character. And they made a movie about Pat. And I guess we could do a list someday about the very best Saturday Night Live movies. I got to say, Blues Brothers would end up being number one, but uh, with Wayne's World trailing probably right behind. Um, let me see here. Uh, let's see. I've always liked that actress. I've always liked Molly Shannon a lot. Um, Mary Catherine Gallagher. The awkward Catholic school student who aspires to be a musical superstar. Yeah. She's, uh, she's pretty awesome. That sounded really funny, Matt Foley. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Saturday Night Live, if, if you, uh, Diana, if you look up that sketch, which is on, um, newarena.com if you look up the article it's on newarena.com and you go through their list and then look up the sketches some of them will be on the NBC site others of them will just be on YouTube and you will laugh your rear end off at some of these sketches uh, they're very 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 good there's a few they, that I might have said should have been on there that were kind of one-offs. One of them was called Stunt Baby uh, with Buck Henry. 
Um, and then uh, you guys remember the uh, Bill Murray and and Gilda Radner were, were like the two kids that would go over to Gilda Radner's mom's house and uh, Mrs. Lubner, come on, Mrs. Lubner. Well, let's have a tang toast, kids, you know. And uh, then there was one called um, that Dan Aykroyd did that I thought to this day is one of the funniest. It's called uh, Fred Garvin, male prostitute. Fred Garvin, male prostitute. Um, let's see here. Okay, thank you, Tom. Yeah, if you've, here, I'm just going to write that one down. In the, the, <laughs> Fred Garvin, male prostitute. <laughs> it's pretty hilarious. It's pretty hilarious. <laughs> oh, brother. Uh, but th there's there's also sketches that were from the news. Uh, I mean, another of the great sketches was um, Bassomatic, Super Bassomatic, which I can't find online. I searched for it the other day. And another one is um, uh, Julia Child. Uh, look up that one. You'll laugh your rear end on that one um, with Dan Aykroyd. And then there were things like during the news, like Jane, you ignorant slut. Um, the, you, you just got to gotta search around. There's so much good stuff, though. There's so many good SNL sketches. Well, I mean, it's been on the air since 1976 or 7. And uh, some casts in some years better than others. Let's, let's be honest. But uh, even during the bad years, they'd, they'd manage to one or two, you know, it'd be, it'd be okay. So anyway, we're uh, sadly at the end of another show. Um, first thing we'd like to do is thank our network partners over there at KCTK Radio Online, rawtalkonline.com, uh, Midnight Joker Radio, uh, Tomorrow Radio out of Dublin, Ireland, iHeart Radio, and uh, wherever else it's at. And, um, oh, Black Jeopardy with Tom Hanks. Black Jeopardy with Tom Hanks is my favorite Black Jeopardy of them all. Uh, Jen Coffey says, awesome show. There was also a Chinese, a Japanese game show with Matt, with uh, Chris Farley on it that was really good. Uh, we'd like to thank the people in our chat room, the finest human beings in the history of mankind on earth. We had the Honorable Jen Coffey in with us. Uh, who uh, is a regular over there on Matt Connerton Unleashed, which is a fine show. I strongly in endorse. Thanks for being here, Jen. Morty Vicker, the Sultan of the Outdoor Grill, was with us. Diana O'Brien from across the pond, also with us. We also had uh, Dolores Colbert, International Woman of Mystery. Terry Lawler, the King of Ireland. Uh, in addition to uh, Thomas Hamilton from Glasgow, Scotland, Midnight Shepherd, Randy Ramos, the chef himself, my sister, my sister, senior lecturer, uh, my sister Kelly. I'm sure I'm missing somebody or some buddies in this whole thing, but um, either way, um, thanks to all you fine people for being here. Um, people saying thanks for a great show. Yeah, well, you know, thank you. Just don't have a show unless you're here. With all that being said, I got to cue up my outro song. And um, I guess the only thing left to say until we're with you again tomorrow, same time, at um, about a quarter to two, sorry, a quarter to three Pacific. And. Uh, Quarter to six Eastern. Does that make sense? I mean, it's four o'clock my time. So it's three o'clock and then it's five, six. Quarter, yeah, no, it does make sense. All right. Uh, the only thing left to say is thank you all for being here. We'll see you tomorrow. And then, um, well, you know, till next time. We'll see you next time. Tend to stray I empathize
hands with your crossed wires I may even share your twisted desires But never go out of my way to see you fall Oh, do you remember when you came to me On the outside looking in You pitched your tent, stole my shit And hit, hit the road again Never did nothing without an angle down below Like everyone else, only so much more so Never go out of my way to see you fall You can trash my songs, forget my lines Drink of my women, steal my wine You can claw your way to the bloody top But never go out of my way I'd never go out of my way to see you I'd never go out of my way to see you fall I guess it's just a matter of a couple of degrees Between standing on your belly and crawling on your knees Remember you and your demons showing up at the door A bottle of Herodura at a quarter to four I cared for you when you didn't even know yourself Man, I helped to become somebody else Still, I'd never go out of my way to see you fall You can trash my songs, forget my lines Drink of my women, steal my wine You can claw your way to the bloody top But I'd never go out of my way I'd never go out of my way I'd never go out of my way to see you fall Hey, anybody want some guitar? Get my life, you can drink of my 